This has been an exciting opportunity being here. Been a lot of great speeches, a lot of great inspiration, and a lot of motivation that myself and I hope others will carry back to their own states and their own town. Um, GOTV. It's usually the last part of a campaign, and it's one of the most important parts of a campaign. How many people in here are running for office this year? Anybody? Okay. Anybody planning on running next year? Okay. One of the things that you'll find out is that although it's the end of your campaign, it's one of the most important parts of your campaign. The workshop that we're going to have today comes from a book written by someone who um, took some time to study the uh, issue of getting out the vote, who was questioned quite a bit about how do you do that? How do you reach the minority community? How do you get the black vote? Like it's an elusive animal. Um, and it's a wonderful book that all of you have probably never heard of but really should get. It's called White Folks Guide to Understanding the Black Community and Get Out the Vote. And it's written by someone I know very well, Pastor Shannon Wright. <laughs> so rather than <laughs> rewrite or redo or recreate the wheel, I'm going to share an excerpt from, me with, from the book with you. We of blacks have not yet attained a panacea in the area of voting rights. We make up 14% of the population as a whole and about one-third of those ineligible to vote because of criminal convictions. Many say this penalty falls harder on us because our incarceration is higher. Some say our incarceration rate is higher and the disparity from others is widened because we're punished more harshly. I'm sure there are also those that would also say our incarceration rate is higher because more of us are criminals. I suppose that's a matter of perception, although it saddens me to know that there are those that think of us in that way. With the ever-occurring legislative changes to the implementation of our rights and abilities to vote, I'm sure this issue will continue to evolve. We need both our legal minds and our moral conscience to find where we belong on the issue. One thing I can tell you is this, and if y'all don't hear anything, Anybody that's, even if you're not running, if you're working on a campaign, this is really key. Stop coming to our churches, to our community centers, to our senior centers, and our schools, like clockwork, when it's election time. Because we don't want to see you then. We want to see you six months before, a year before, once a month, when something happens, not when you need that vote. Politics is about all of the people all of the time. It's, if it's not your intention to represent your whole district, then please don't bother to attempt to placate us with a photo op as you trot through the hood right before the election. If you want us to vote, craft a message that speaks to us, not at us. Meet us where we are. Don't stand on the mountaintop and tell us what you think we need. Lend a hand up so we can get to the mountaintop with you. Then set the table and invite us to break bread with you. And then you'll have our full attention. Usually, the blitz, because that's what we're going to talk about next. Usually the blitz would be phase two of your get out the vote effort. It would usually start a few days before election day. And in case you haven't realized, by the proliferation of Republican black elected officials that we have all over the place, that doesn't work. You cannot come at us right before and expect us to believe you. We don't trust you, we don't believe you, and this is partly because of being dulled down and dumbed down through the process and the evolution of the entitlement mentality. We are accustomed to candidates running through our neighborhoods a few weeks before an election. The problem is we know we won't see you again until the next election. We know you don't put much stock in our votes, so we don't put much stock in you. If you want to get our attention, come to us first. 
Let us know what really matters to you. Make us feel like our issues are of concern to you. Start the blitz early. Get us involved. Include us in the planning and development phase of your campaigns, not just the photo ops. We know our issues. Identify those with similar mindset to you, then ask them questions and listen. Let me repeat, listen to what they actually have to say. And then incorporate that into your overall strategy. Then publicly, and here's something we all have a little trouble with sometimes, publicly give them credit for it. Show yourself an involved team player. If you start your blitz early enough, you could go into our neighborhoods and identify supporters and make them neighborhood captains. Their whole job would be to get the folks they know in the neighborhood that also want something different and motivate them to get involved. Have competitions, give prizes, have t-shirt design contests, have a team spirit contest or recruitment contest. Whichever you choose, obviously it's up to you. The bottom line is to reach out early and make sure to be sincere and inclusive. If you want us to not just believe in you, but also believe you, you must make us more than an afterthought. Come to our neighborhoods early and blitz early. You catch more flies with honey than vinegar. If the goal of your get up, if the goal of your get out the vote campaign is to identify who your supporters are and get as many of them as possible to actually go out and vote for you, you're going about it all wrong to attract the black vote. Your GOV team is not responsible for persuading people to support your candidate. That job belongs to the rest of your campaign structure. The GOV team's team is their job is to get people to go to the polls and vote. But that's just not happening, hence why we don't have candidates that we know understand the issues and relate the issues and believe in our core values actually getting elected. Because I'm sure you all know that Einstein theory, something about insanity and repeating the same thing. The Republican Party of today seems to be stuck on that boat. Hence why the results that we're getting are the results we'll continue to get until something's changed. The last chapter of the book and the section on getting out the vote is what I'm going to skip to because I think it means the most. It says, let ye without sin cast the first stone. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, well, you know what I mean. I put childish ways behind me, 1 Corinthians 13, 11. You must understand. Because of the entitlement mentality, because of history, because of the things that we've been brainwashed to believe, many of us have yet not matured to that level of understanding who we are and how to correlate what we say we believe into how we actually vote. A historic perspective on why we are where we are politically. When the Civil War ended, our struggle for equality began. Most blacks saw the Republican Party as the party of freedom. During Reconstruction, this was true. After Reconstruction, the Republican Party became a minority party in the South with very few white Republicans. The Democrats, or the 3S party, slavery, secession, and segregation had all the power. Blacks in the South were left to fight for themselves. The Republican Party left them to build alliances on their own, and this didn't work. The last thing the racist South wanted were free blacks. They wanted free labor and power. The violence in the South against the freedom was unbearable. Many injustices were, were committed at the hands of the racist Democrats. Now, most of y'all in this room understand the true history of the Republican and the Democrat parties. The problem is in the messaging. When you do, you get out the vote and you go to talk to people. And I'm gonna to skip to the end because we've lost a lot in the room and I don't wanna bore anybody, but if you take one thing home to heart, hear this. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. If you go into a minority community, let's just keep it real, you go into the hood and you start talking about the Constitution and you're talking to people that actually go to school at what we call those dropout centers and we're talking to people who are, let's say, male, so you know, 70% of them aren't going to graduate anyway, you start talking about the Constitution, you might as well give them a sleeping pill and a pillow. But if you go in that hood and you start asking them questions like, Aren't you tired of having to fight your way through your neighborhood like you're living in a war zone? 
And aren't you tired of knowing that the senior citizens in your community are like slaves and tied and hidden in their homes because of fear of home invasion and gang activity? Aren't you tired of your children getting shot as they mind their business coming home from school because you're not there because you're working two or three jobs? Because see, you, you believed in that welfare mentality so the man's not in the house and you got no choice but to work those two or three jobs. Aren't you tired of that? Don't you want to defend yours? Now, when you say that in that way to those same people, it will resonate. It's not the message, it's, it's, it's how you spin it. Because if you say the Constitution, they don't glaze over, it's over the head. But if you talk to people about the issues in a way that they can relate, it'll resonate, it'll stay with them, they'll understand it. If you talk about education, you go into the hood talking about core curriculum, what is that? I send my kids to school, they're safe, they're off the streets, they come home with a book they must be learning. Explain it in the way that do you want your children to go to school and study something that will only leave them able to ask, will that be paper or plastic? They will get it. Because that's where we're at. And that's how serious it is in the black community. I can't speak for any other community because I'm black. And despite being black, I'm still here, even though my family thought being black meant being Democrat. They started to speak to me again, but it took a minute. If you take the issues, education, and you turn it around, and you say to them, do you want to hand down your welfare card in Section 8? Or do you want to raise a child that will actually be able to take care of you instead of putting you in a nursing home and hoping somebody comes to change your diaper? If you translate housing into, do you want to be living with Mickey and Minnie or do you want to actually be in a place where you'd be proud to call your home and have your family and friends come to? They will understand that. Because despite how it may seem and despite what everyone may say, there is nobody in the hood living with Mickey and Minnie, stepping over vials and needles that's happy, happy right. to be living that way. Right. That's right. So that, that ever dwindling black vote, there is. But you gotta go in there and you gotta look them straight in the eye. And you gotta talk to them like somebody. And you gotta turn that issue around in a way that everybody can relate to. And it may take a little work to find that way, but it's there. I titled my book, White Folks Guide to Understand in the Black Community and Get Out the Vote for a couple reasons. One, I wanted to see people's eyebrows go up when I said the name of the book. Because to me that's funny. <laughs> Two, when I ran for office, and yes, didn't win, the one question I got the most was, how do we get the black vote? Well, I said, okay. I'm not one for repeating myself, and my four children can tell you I say it once, you good, I say it twice. There's a problem, I say it three times, I'm saying it with a belt. So I, I'm not one for repeating myself. So I figured, let me just write it down. And then in that true Republican state of, of, of the economy, the way we know it to be in capitalism, I said, well, most publishers aren't going to publish this, so I created my own publishing company to publish it myself. Because I realized that if you have a message, that's not enough. You have to actually get that message out there so people can hear it. And if nothing else, so they can learn from it. And you never know, for anybody that's in here that's a little bit disgusted and frustrated and aggravated, don't be. Because you might be that one person that touches one other person, that touches a thousand. And you never know who that might be. So I say to you, in summary, it's the message. We're all saying the same thing. We're all pretty much on the same page. It's how you say it. If I come to you and you speak French, and I come to you and I'm speaking Spanish, I may be saying the same thing, but you'll never know. You have to translate the message so that it can be understood and so it can, it can, it can be a seed that's planted in one root, it can resonate. And when it comes to the blitz part of your campaign, do it early. Come see us regularly. Don't just come, come by, you know, do a drive through at a fish fry the week before election day, but we don't see you then. Come by, sit down, stay a minute. And as my grandmother used to say, and I'm gonna close with this, 
I used to be afraid of my grandmother when I was little. I didn't understand it until I got older. And all of a sudden, when I got older, she got smarter. I don't know how that happened. But as my grandmother would say, don't talk so much, because we all like to talk. Go in, sit down, shut up, and listen, and you might learn something. Sometimes it's not what you say. It's what you let people say to you and that you actually listen. Thank you. My name is Anita Moncrief. I am very glad to be here today. Um, many, people, many people know me from my work with ACORN and from traveling around the country talking to people. And I've just been so pleased with the things I've seen today. I always talk about the power that black conservatives could uh, yield if we all would just work together. And I want to talk to you about some of the stuff that I've seen. Uh, when I was a liberal, I used to be one of those bullhorn of uh, having, signing, holding, yelling at people, chip on the shoulder, liberals out there protesting on street corners. I worked with ACORN and we went out to different areas and held up signs and protested everything from housing, foreclosures to Wells Fargo to whatever. We would give people a lunchable and a sign and put them in the back of a van and send them off. And this happened. Over and over again throughout the years, it went through from uh, election years we were more active to off years when we did pizza parties and campaign, uh, you know, get out there, you know, get togethers and everything else. But it was never ending, and I realized there was a reason for that. When you look at where these communities were, there was always some group out there active in them throughout the year. There was never something that wasn't going on. Campaign years were just extra work. And there was a reason why we did that. It's because those people became trusted messengers in the community. They became the people you went to when you wanted to talk to someone about your politics or your problems or what's going on with your local business. Those people were trusted messengers. And that's where we have why Obama was so effective with his campaign. Hold on a second. And technology is not my thing, guys. Okay, you're going to go to the next thing here. Okay, I'm just going to run this computer myself. Guys, hold on one second. Okay, what happens when you run for office and you don't win? Now what? Do you pack up? Do you go home? Do you dust your uh, shoulders off and start something new? What do you do? Now you have people like Star Parker and Charles Lawler and some great people that have run for office and they just didn't shut down everything and go back into obscurity. They decided that they were going to do something else. And Star is a really good example of that. She runs an organization that is active in you know, her area. She's out there, she's visible. She's talking to people. It's called the permanent campaign. You never stop running for office because really what you do is you start building a reputation in these communities. So that's what it is. What's next? Now what? That office is closed down, the signs are down, everybody's gone home, there's no interns there waiting to greet you with great stats and numbers about how you're doing. There's nothing left. Those so signs are now gathering dust. 
Donna Massey. Donna Massey was an Acorn board member who uh, ran for a local office um, out of Chicago. She worked with a lot of these different groups and she went around the country and all of a sudden she was known. She was on TV, she was speaking about health care, and the next time she ran, she actually won. Acorn, let's talk a little bit about that. How many people think Acorn has gone away? Good. They have gone underground. Look at all of these offices where you see the little acorn symbol. Across the country, these offices were operating from sometimes as early as the 1970s up until 2010, 2009 in some circumstances, but mostly 2010. So what did they do when acorn disbanded? Did they close up shop? Did they go away? Did they stop all their organizing? No. They changed their names. In most cases, in almost every single instance, those offices are operating nationwide under different names, with the same tax ID number. They just scratched out one name in crayon and wrote another one in crayon and kept going. It's the permanent campaign. And what, how is that important? You guys remember Teddy Kennedy. Think about this. An organization that runs a permanent campaign over and over again throughout the years garners a lot of power, a lot of connections, people that owe their office to them. Look at what Teddy Kennedy did for uh, ACORN. Not only was he instrumental in getting minimum wage passed at the national level, but he gave them legitimacy. He gave them a, um, a public face that was one that was respected because he's a Kennedy. He, couldn't, he was a Kennedy. You couldn't really get around that. It was something that they worked hard and they earned it because they were working with these people from the 70s. When ACORN came out of Arkansas and they were coming up in the 70s and 80s, who do you think was coming up right behind them? Bill Clinton. He was a little known uh, governor who uh, had a great reputation with black people in the communities. Where did he get that from? ACORN. So when Clinton came to DC, so did ACORN. They use that type of, uh, these type of connections to get clout in what we call street cred in the communities. And what did that street cred lead them? Led them right to the White House with Barack Obama. They took a state senator and made him a United States senator and made him president of the United States. How did they do it? The permanent campaign. And that's where we want to get into the nuts and bolts of how that actually works. But it's ingenious. Look at this. This is a picture from 2013 from a site called advocatesinaction.org. This is an acorn group out of Arizona who changed their name and they're still out there doing the same thing even though they're saying something new. It's the same old thing guys. Organizing, being activists, getting visible, getting people to stand behind them because that's how you get on the five o'clock news. That's how you uh, get change by getting out there. Think about what happened. Let's take a um, case study. How many of you guys have heard about what happened with the Boy Scouts recently? Yes. That was something where the Boy Scouts were trying to decide whether or not they were going to let in openly gay members. I was on the coalition that was against this. And let me tell you what we did. We got a coalition letter together. We signed a petition. We put an ad in the newspaper. And the usual conservative stuff. Let me tell you what the other side did. They put pressure on the funders. They went to the corporate donors. They had uh, protests and uh, staging um, what they call little actions across the country. So what do you think was more effective? Having people sitting outside the Boy Scout office, the Boy Scout office with signs and protesting, or having a petition that was on a website that people that no one went to, or having an ad in a newspaper that no one paid attention to. The problem with our side is that we are predictable. We do the same things over and over again. This is she was saying before. The left are long-range planners. They can already plan what's going to happen and work around it. That's what they do. I remember in 2007 when Barack Obama wasn't black enough for black people. You guys remember that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. We like he was talking about you know surfing and all this other stuff. We don't know anything about him. Now all of a sudden we were all about Hillary. We were thinking, okay, this is going to be the third time of Bill Clinton. We were like, okay, let's do this. I was a Hillary supporter. We all were. So they had a problem: how to make Barack Obama black enough for black people. So all of a sudden he's going on Tabby Smiley, he's hanging out with Jay-Z, he's talking about helping brother out, he's, you know, all this little crazy stuff, he's playing the most awkward basketball I've ever seen in my life. But they, were, and they kept talking about how black Michelle was, 
It's like, look, she's black. Pull her out again. Now, all these pictures have come out of all the white girlfriends Obama had uh, now. But back then, it was all about the fact that Michelle was black and she was a real black woman. She wasn't light skinned like me, she was really black. You know, they're talking about the edges in her hair and everything. It was hilarious. They're trotting the kids out, you know, everything. And then they did, that wasn't enough. So, what did they do? They started talking about it in terms of history, how it was going to be this historic moment, this great moment, the first black president. That's all you heard across the nation where all these pundits put it in terms of how it wasn't about the man, it was about the fact that we had to elect him because we needed a black man to be president. What the left does is marketing and PR. Everything with them is a marketing campaign. You want to pass health care? Think about it. In 2009, when we were in a financial crisis, when the jobs were one of the first things that the president should have been worried about, what were they focusing on? Health care. Yeah. Why? Because you have these coalitions across the country out there clamoring for health care, on the news, protesting, talking about grandmas dying and everything mm -hmm. else. And look at this poor little child with leukemia who doesn't have health care. They pushed the issue so much that it got to national attention, and all of a sudden, Barack Obama had to do something right then and there about health care. It was this big rush to pass it. You know how many people were killed in the hood every single day? You know how many people were shot all the time? But when they want to pass gun control, now all of a sudden every single news station reports every time a cat gun goes off. Right. Oh gosh, there was a water gun spotted yesterday in Chicago, Illinois. Blah, blah, blah. Those same stories weren't getting reported a year ago because they didn't matter. They only matter now because they want to take our guns away, so they put them on TV. It's a marketing campaign, and we're not good at marketing. We're not good at PR. We're not good at thinking strategically and out of the box, and that's what we have to get to. How to run that permanent campaign. How to think smart, work, and, and build stronger communities. Yes? The other thing you needed was that if you really look at the, uh, the, gun, the, okay. the gun control thing, um, when all uh, the young men in New Orleans and Chicago and Atlanta and everywhere else are getting killing each other every day, they don't talk about it, but when 20, and bless their hearts, when 20 white kids up in, in uh, Massachusetts get, get killed, it's all over the news. Yeah. Exactly. So who are they targeting? Exactly. It's just like Dave Chappelle said. He said, you'll never see a terrorist call the White House and say, I've got five black people. Black people are bad bargaining chips. You know, it's just not going to happen. You know, no one's going to... <laughs> No one's going to really care, and that's one of the things that we have to realize is that we're up against a media that understands that, and they they program us. They put those cute little kids on TV, and Obama then holds press conferences and uses kids as props. It's all PR. Yeah. So what do we do? We start working with community leaders, and as she was saying before, we don't come in before the election. We don't come in, you know, a week before the election. We need to build infrastructures in these communities working with citizens that care and that want to get involved. As conservatives, we're used to individual responsibility, and we don't want handouts, and that's the thing. We think if we do organizing, we have to go into the handout culture, and that's not true. Think about how this nation was built. It was built on the collective knowledge of people working together. You had people that were doing things like, um, what do they call them, apprenticeships and teaching folks. And we had Main Street. We were working together to build America. So we can do all of this without personal chair, I mean, without uh, handouts and uh, charity and things like that. We can bring our principles into the communities, but we have to do it consistently. We those spaces have to be trusted. I spent a summer in Sheila Jackson Lee's district in uh, Houston, Texas, and at first, no one trusted me, and they, you know, were looking around like, what are you, you know, what are you about? And, you know, but I was there every day, every single day, talking to the crackheads, talking to the prostitutes. I had a guy who told me he just spent fifteen thousand dollars to do a survey, and that I spent five minutes with a local crackhead to get the same information, and I spent about five dollars and I bought a pack of cigarettes. People are afraid to go into these communities, so they think their surveys and their polls are telling them what they need to know, and it's not. 
We come across this stiff and uncaring when that's quite the opposite. Ever since I became a conservative, I have met some of the most kindest, warmest, most open people in my life. People that are not racist, that are not hateful, but unfortunately, we don't know how to convey that when we're talking our issues. Right. My mom, bless her heart, she used to be one of those women that would kiss that Obama poster and talk about swagger in a way that made me very uncomfortable. But <laughs> I brought her around, and all of a sudden she was like, you know what? She came to me one day, and it's a long story, make it short. And she told me, you know what, I think he's a socialist. And it only took me two years, and I knew she was talking about Obama, and I nearly fell off my chair, and I was like, well, praise the Lord, we got one. But then, 2012, she comes back to me, and she says she can't vote for Romney. She can't bring herself to do it. And I asked her, why? And she said, well, there's a war on women. Romney hates women. So my mom was college educated, she worked with the Postal Service for 16 years, and I told my friends on Capitol Hill about this, and they was like, well, what's wrong with her? And I said, no, what's wrong with us? Why can't we get a college educated woman who won't vote for Obama to vote for Romney? What's wrong with our messaging? Where did we go wrong? Why have we let them, let them control the narrative to the point where we're losing people that could be potential voters? We're so busy talking about the debt to ceiling ratio and the, and the, the theory of this and the theory of that, and we miss out how to talk to people for real. We overthink things. You know, I've sat in so many meetings and I'm thinking, all these degrees and not a lick of common sense in the room. It's just, it's amazing. And when you tell them just the simplest little messaging things, they act like, you know, you're the smartest person there. And being the only black person in these rooms, it gets tiring. Because it should not have to be that way. I shouldn't have to come in and say, hey, just talk to them like a person. And they're like, oh, wow, she's smart. What else you got over there? You know? <laughs> We got, and that's another. We gotta stop treating our black conservatives like rock stars. Yeah. You know, I don't want to be a rock star. I want to be part of the group. I don't want to be the person that you look to whenever there's an issue that has to do with minorities. Well, Nina, what do you think? And everybody turns to me and they've got this look of expectation. And it reminds me of being in high school when it was a Black History Month, and my liberal uh, professor, or my liberal teacher, wanted me to read Phenomenal Woman. And I'm like, well, thanks for realizing I can read finally, but why am I only picking up Black History Month to get up here and read? We, go, we come at it the wrong way. And I tell people, I don't think it's racism. I just think it's miscommunication. We have honest intentions, but we've been cowed by the left so much that we don't know how to express these things. We're so, we're going against their boundaries and their words and the things we can't say and the areas we can't go. And I know Acorn would tell people all the time, oh, we got it, just give us some money. We're registering black people in their communities. And they would turn right around and hire 20 year old white kids with no experience and send them out of the hood to register people. And they're telling you it's too dangerous to go out there. And they did this over and over again. So what are their strategies? What are their tactics? These numbers are from the 2012 election for Obama, and it just gives you a little bit of an idea. Think about it. They had 2.2 million volunteers, 30K core team members. These are the core people now, the people that they actually spent money on and trained. They had uh, 10,000 neighborhood team leaders and 2,000 uh, 2, field organizers. Those are more of your paid staff plus your volunteers. You know what? Do you, uh, could you imagine what a right ground game would look like if we had those type of numbers? We had nowhere near that out there. I was undercover in uh, since, I'm sorry, Cleveland, Ohio on election day. I had spent the week before in the Obama office now. Now they were all efficient, they got their iPads and their iPhones and they're out there uh, training folks, getting them out, bringing people by the van for, for early voting, which was 30 days. And then I would go over after that and I'd hang out at the Romney office. So of course, once again, they treated me like I was a rock star, so that was kind of cool. But they were eating nice sandwiches and people were sitting around talking and milling, but there wasn't a lot of organizing going around. There wasn't a lot of training, and it was just mostly the same type of people every single day just sitting there talking about politics. On election day, after Orca failed, um, now Obama was off playing basketball on election day, and the Organizing for America office was running like clockwork, so I left, went over to the Romney office. Orca had failed that morning. People were upset. They were around there just talking, milling around as usual. And then about 3 p.m., some guy pulls out a paper walk list and goes, does anybody know how to read this? And that's when I was like, you know what, I'm going home. I went back to the hotel, took a shower, went to sleep. I knew it was over. 
I, the polls hadn't even closed yet, and I knew it was over. We did not have a ground game. We were not prepared. We didn't know what we were dealing with, and we were cocky and expected Orca to solve all of our problems. And I'm just being honest, guys. Right. This is what they did. They did registration, persuasion, and turnout. They went straight from voter registration into persuasion. They would take those voter registration people and they say, you know what, I want to make sure you got on the polls. Could you sign my, uh, sign my little clipboard right here? So all of a sudden they get their name, their email address, all their information, and basically what is a opt-in for them to send emails. And the emails and the uh, text from Obama going, hey you. You know, or emails. Hey, it's, it's Michelle. You know, I've got a secret to tell you. I'm sorry, you got to open it up. It's Michelle Obama. So this is what they did to persuade voters to get out. And then turnout. They were taking people, getting them to pledge cards, saying they promised to go to the polls. They were picking them up in vans, and I have an actual video on my YouTube channel, which is Anita Montgomery One, of an Obama for America van picking up people in the hood and saying that they weren't partisan and that they were up, that any Romney, Romney voters were welcome to get on the van anyway. But come on now, that wasn't happening. So they were taking them by the van load to the polls. They did this all the way through. Look at the numbers here. 150 million phone calls, 1.8 million voter registration forms, and that was just from the launch in, 20, in 2012 alone. You know how many people were registered when I was working at ACORN between 2005 and 2008? Seven million. Seven million unmatched voters. When I say unmatched, I mean there was nothing like that coming from the right. Seven million. I'm really messed with this technology thing down, guys. <laughs> types of training. Now, there is no type of training on the right that you get when you come in. They might put you through a little class or a webinar, but for every single person, whether you are a volunteer, a fellow, or a staff member, you receive some type of specialized training from the Obama campaign. Webinars, all staff training, one-on-one -on -one coaching, group skills training. They're creating permanent organizers. So after that campaign is over, they have a database of organizers that can be activated at any time that are well trained. Do we understand what we're up against right now? Hmm. Hold on one second, I'm getting this here. Acorn. This is the slide from 2006, and the reason why I put this in there is because if you guys will remember what Obama said during his State of the Union address about minimum wage, minimum wage is going to be the wedge issue that breaks our party. We had this happen in 06. They had, now think about the turnout for midterm elections, not a presidential election, but midterm elections. They had 56% people come out and vote for it and 44% against. But let's just not talk about the numbers, let's talk about the turnout. When I wrote the uh, political plans for Colorado, Ohio, and Maryland, we took the House back in 06, and we did it by put a, putting minimum wage on the ballot on the ballot, on the ballot in seven battleground states. In Florida, over 76% of the total voting age population turned out to vote for minimum wage. 76%. Those numbers are astounding for midterm. And what they did when they voted for minimum wage, they brought in the class of 06. Nancy Pelosi, Harry Reid, all of them. That's how we took back the House. So if you think it's going to be any different in 2014, they're going to use minimum wage to take back the House. And we like that little, and this is my analogy here, we're like rats and we see the cheese. The cheese is Boy Scouts. The cheese is gay marriage. The cheese is minimum wage, health care, whatever. We see the cheese and we go, oh, cheese! And we grab it and we eat it. And as soon as we eat it, we come out with something like, no, we're against health care. No, we're against minimum wage. No, we're against immigration. We come out, no, on everything else. And that's the cheese. And they're like, gotcha. Let me tell you this today. Don't eat the cheese, guys. The cheese is a trap. When you see the cheese, think about it for a second. And before you say no, say, you know what? I am for immigration. I'm for legal immigration. I'm for health care. I think everyone should have health care through their employers. You know, but it's not a right. <laughs> I'm for um, whatever. But we have to start being for something. Because as soon as we say we're against something, they got us. And they frame the debate, and it's all over. And that's exactly what they're going to do in 2014. And if we're not careful, we're going to lose the house. Midterm voting by age, and this is important because if you look, it drops 
you know, look at how much, that's our age right, our demographic right there, but it has the highest percentage. But if you add a wage issue like minimum wage, it's the youth turnout is going to increase. And that's the problem. The youth, Latino and minority turnout increases. And those are areas we have historically had the hardest time recruiting voters from. And they know that. And that's why they're going to use wedge issues in 2014. This is a group, an offshoot group, that it was a coalition of Project Vote, ACORN, SEIU, Emily's List, and Planned Parenthood. They got 165,000 voter registrations just working in two states. What do we have on our side to take and we're close? Has the right paid any attention to voter registration at all? No. This is why we're not running a permanent campaign. We're barely running a good campaign during, our, um, during election years. And if you look at the numbers of the people that turned out, like I said, these are Obama's 2012 numbers after the election. Or between Obama and Romney, we're losing in key demographics because, as we've heard all day, messaging. Not being in these communities where we're supposed to. Poor outreach. I talked to, um, what's his name? Mike Berger over at the NRCC back in 2000, 2010 when Star Parker and Charles Lawler were running. Star was running against Laura Richardson who has obvious ethics problems. She was doing a great campaign and she could have won. Charles Lawler was running against Steny Hoyer, one of the most senior Democrats in uh, Congress, and he had a chance to really upset him. He lost, he won all of Southern Maryland and lost PG County, Maryland, which has the highest black concentration. And I asked Mike, I'm like, why aren't you guys supporting these guys? He's like, well, blah, 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 and $50,000 wasn't raised, and we just don't think they can win it, and they, we're not going to do any. So he told me they're not going to do any minority outreach and spend any money on minorities until 20. 16 because they said with Obama it didn't matter. This was straight out of his mouth from the NRCC. So Starr lost her race, Charles Lawrence lost his race, Alan West was thrown under the bus, and they keep saying they want us in the party, but they have done nothing to show me that they're, that's true. I tell people that if the Republican Party was a person, he would be that abusive ex-boyfriend that keeps telling you he loves you and he's going to spend money on you and come back and you're trying to explain to your family and friends why you keep going back to this guy. But in all, in truth, in all uh, truth, we have to let them go. They're like this year, we're going to spend $10 million on minority outreach. We have to stop waiting on the party to do the outreach. And I don't believe outreach is a great word because it already denotes that there's an other involved. I call it broadening the base because I don't feel like there's been so many uh, incarnations of Anita Moncrief trying to fit into the Republican Party. I thought I had to wear three-piece suits. I didn't want to wear my braids. This year at CPAC, I had, was rocking my braids with a leather skirt. But you know what? I'm tired of trying to change to be accepted into this party. The party wants us to, we need, they need to change for us to come in. They need to learn how they accept us come as we are. Like Andrew Breitbart. They didn't know how they, what to do with Breitbart. He had on wrinkled jeans and a t-shirt with a book bag and would show up at CPAC around all these three-piece suits. But he didn't care. They were going to have to accept it because he was kicking in the door and coming in just as he was. And that's exactly what we have to do. Stop waiting for the party. Their day is over. It is time for us to run a permanent campaign. It's time for us to take responsibility and get active and involved in these communities. Now, you're going to get door slammed in your face. You've got pe people, they call me a coon, an Uncle Tom. They said I was a threat to the black community, all kinds of crazy stuff. But it doesn't matter. We're the ones that have to do this because if we went on the party, we're going to lose. Working on the right, I mean on the left, they're working on a progressive majority that's going to last for the next 50 to 60 years. They're long range planners. When I was there, they were planning what was going to happen for the next 10 years. Everything has slowed them down a little bit with the Tea Party movement because no one could have planned that. But they're still right on track and we are in danger right now. And I'm going to go quickly through the rest of this for you guys. But just think about it, they're focusing on urban areas, new registrations. They didn't say that they were going to go out and register voters. They said they were going to create new voters. And that's what you're going to see right now with this amnesty bill that's pushing through. And then these wedge issues that they're using to divide the party. No one's going to do an autopsy on a, on a parent's suicide. They expect us to implode from within. And we are doing a really good job of it with all the infighting. Have you seen what's going on with immigration just within our party? They put these wedge issues out there and allow us to kill each other so then they sit back and watch and they just eat popcorn just waiting for someone's head to explode. And every single time we fall for it. It's the cheese. This is what we have to do. Door to door. 
We need to leverage the social media. We need to stop using direct mail. Every, every time a consultant tells me about direct mail, I just want to slap him. Seriously. <laughs> Sorry, I'm more violent there. But direct mail is not the key. Neither is all the expensive ads they tell you you need to buy. Personal contact is the way to go. And you just don't have to just do door knocking. Just going out, just one second, going out and talking to people. And as she was saying before, being real. I don't talk about Obama when I go in the neighborhoods. I talk about the issue. I live in PG County, Maryland. My daughter goes to public school. Believe me, I have enough issues to talk about without ever mentioning Obama's name. Right. Yes. Right. See, uh, look, I got to go right now because I got to get home because I have like five uh, of these rhetorical question uh, surveys that I need to fill out and send back to the Tea Party and, and the RNC and uh, a couple other groups, okay? So I hear exactly what you're talking about. If I get one more rhetorical question, do you, uh, are you pro-life, are you this, are you that, please send us a donation. It ain't working. They're wasting, exactly. they're wasting trees and postage. You are exactly right. right. I've been talking right to them in D.C. about that. I'm working with the coalition yeah. now in D.C. and we're trying to yeah. get people to understand that they've got to stop doing that. I mean, you've got to engage your members much better than that. Think about how much money people would give if they actually got a call from uh, Tony Perkins or Matt Kibbe and they were on the phone on conference call. And that does a great job of outreach. But some of these other organizations only use their list to get, uh, to get money. And that's what it's all about. I was in uh, Texas the other day, and Rice Priebus was there, and I, I promise you, if he could have done any more tap dancing, it was amazing. The tap dancing and the pandering, and the, we're all out there, and I got $10 million for Minority Outreach, and we're listening to you. No, he's gone. He's broke. That's the problem. They need money. And that's why they're out there on this apology tour. But you know, if they really were sincere, they wouldn't have Carl Rove writing their autopsy report or helping them on our route. So I doubt they're really going to change. So this is just stuff you can do. These groups were out there doing protests, they were turkey protesting. Street theater is very is a very effective tool. A lot of times the media responds to street theater because it gives them something funny to put on the five o'clock news. If you're out there and you got a rat up there in front of um, Sherwood Williams or you're talking about the long shock of the year award and you got about twenty people, you can get a spot on the five o'clock news. The off campaign news. The Hydra. This is something that has never been seen before outside of a few donors. We just are uh, putting it out there this weekend. The Hydra was created by a group that I'm working with, True the Vote, and it's C4, True the Vote. Now, we have identified the groups that are working together. As you know, with the Hydra, you cut the head off and then another one sprouts back up. This is what we have. If you look very closely at all the names of the groups that are going around here, they're prepared. They're focused. They're a legion. I mean, you've got 80 plus groups working on election integrity. You've got all these unions. You've got the uh, the gay rights issues. You've got the all just it's amazing. Throughout every every ten single calls from healthcare to immigration has a nonprofit here that is behind it, including La Raza, who was at the table with Marco Rubio when the Heritage Foundation and other groups were not. And they're not stopping, they're everywhere. They've got billions of dollars in funding. If you look at True the Vote, whose budget was less than a million dollars last year, and you look at Project Vote, it's um, counterpart, their budget was $38 million for one election cycle. When you look at the ACORN groups, the League of Lim Limited, uh, Women Voters, the NAACP, all of these groups are working together nonstop. And this is what we're trying to do. Now this is something that we wanted to explain to you guys. If you look at the year-round efforts to support election integrity and the voter outreach stuff, this is just for true the vote. But I just wanted you guys to think about this in a way that will help you out. Think about what would happen if we all started working together. And this is where it comes, something that a lot of people are saying, I say is controversial, but I'm going to say it anyway. Sorry, this is the coalition. Let me just here. This is the coalition letter. All those groups will sign different types of coalition letters, and once again, it makes their voices sound um, louder. But back to what I'm saying. Imagine next time you get an email from AFP, an email from Freedom Works, an email from Tea Party Patriots, and they're asking you for money. What if you were to start responding back and saying, "You know what? I'm not giving you a dime until you start learning how to work together. We are stronger together." 
The left are coalition builders. They know how to pull their resources together and get something done. The right will go, oh, that's a great idea. Let me go over here and do something slightly different, you know. But the left, but on the left, they go, let me help you. Let's work together. Let's get it done. And now while we are, I'm not saying we get rid of our conservative principles, we do need to have strong individualism. We do need to have, you know, to be independent. But at the same time, we are losing our country right now because we refuse to work together because a few people in D.C. have some unbelievable egos. And I'm tired of that. And I'm tired of passing around it and worrying about not being invited to the next event or whatever. Let's just call a spade a spade. Come These on. groups don't deserve our money until they learn how to use it the right way. And we need to start letting them know. Look at the left and look at the right. We can't even come up with a comprehensive data system. The left has the voter activation network, this huge head that is head, that is in Chicago, that it has information down to what type of socks you're wearing and what time you get up in the morning. We don't have anything like this. Offer went down on the election day. What are we doing to stop on the tide that's turning this country basically red? Look at all these groups. And then look at the little tiny little baby groups that over here on the left, including Carl Rose Pryor is stuck in there too. Hmm. These are just some of the things we can do, such as contacting local election officials, working with central committee members. You guys already know this stuff, but really and truly it comes into the fact that there is a sense of getting back to mourning in America, getting back to being proud about this country. I am so glad that everybody's been talking about coming out because <coughs> I say that all the time. What if we had a coming out party? I am tired of being on the defensive. I'm tired of having to defend being conservative. I'm tired of having to defend loving my country and loving God and my family. We need to get on the offensive and have them on the run. And the only way we're going to do that once again is by getting together, using social networking, using blogs, getting the message out there. And basically, what if? What if we did all of this? What if we got back to morning in America? We are, and I'm going to come back to this, but we are individually stronger together. And that's what we have to realize. We won't get there until we start working together. We won't get anywhere. When you look at the different uh, ideologies of how the parties work together, it said one side practiced politics as though they were a series of great war and for true battles. The other was as though they were directing the coastal world air war from a command center hundreds of miles away, disinclined to muddy a single boot on the ground. You can tell which party is which. It's time to get dirty, guys. It's time to get in the mud. It's time to make some changes. Thank you. I'll take a couple of questions and then I'll get down since no one's telling me. Any, any questions? Yes. Comment. You're a rock star, girl. I love you. <laughs> I love you. I second that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Every, every time I hear you, this is the second time I've heard you talk live, and every time I hear you talk and spread the message, you are spot on. Here, here. Thank you. you. I appreciate that. On. I thank you guys for the opportunity. I thank you for the work you've done. And I was telling um, Christy last night, next year it's going to be even bigger and better because this is they're not going to stop us. We're only going to continue to grow. Thank you. Um, in a setting like this, and everybody, myself included, will shout out amen, and we love it, and we go, that's it, that's spot on. And then, if, if I'm not alone, and I don't think I am, we probably hear information that we say at our kitchen tables. And so you go, how does this information get to the people who are making decisions that reflect us as a group? Because, it, like it or not, we do have a group of people in power that make decisions that have far-reaching implications. They reflect all of us. So I'm wondering, this information that you just shared, who hears this on a regular basis, semi-regular basis, that has power and influence to understand that something different needs to happen? 
I am so glad you asked that question. I am part of a coalition that meets weekly in D.C. Uh, it includes Alan West, Steve Bannon, uh, Jenny Thomas, Sandy Rios, Frank Gaffney, a lot of the big people on the left, I mean on the right. You need to ask your people, are you a part of Groundswell? It's called Groundswell, and if they're not a part of, uh, part of Groundswell, they need to be. Tom Fitton from Judicial Watch. We meet every week, and we have been working on this messaging, and it's something that has been amazing. When I joined this group in January, they were sitting around the table trying to figure out how to work together. And they were like, well, what do we do? We're, you know, we don't want to go up against anybody. We don't want to knock any, um, rock any boats. Now, if, if you've seen what's happened with Benghazi, what's happening with the IRS scandals, that was us. We were pushing that stuff out from behind the scenes. Alan West has been helping us a lot with our messaging. And so it is happening. For the first time in our history, conservatives are sitting down at the table and working together. And it's coming around. Star Parker has been to our ground swell meetings. We're inviting other people to come. And if, if your group's not a part of it, they need to be. Because this is how the left operates. And never before did they ever think that we're going to get a bunch of conservatives in the same room and get them on the same page and the same message. So it's getting there, but it's slow going because we can't get the people with reach to come to the table. Right. And so until the big groups come to the table, we're doing as best as we can, but we're just knocking out that door. That's good. Is there going to be any kind of a serious attempt to educate conservatives and Republicans about who Democrats and liberals are? Because yes. Because they know exactly who we are. We say what we mean. We do business on a handshake. We care about country. We care about God. We care about people. And we're generally honest in our dealings. So that's who we are. They know that, but we don't know who they are. When I got here yesterday, I hadn't slept in two days. I had been working on a presentation that we showed in Houston to a bunch of big donors, and I mean billionaire donors. And the idea was basically what we presented to you today, that we're individually stronger together, and we're asking them to come to the table with us and to get educated, which means that we would do nationwide training working with the groups that have these listservs, and they're willing to come in and get part of the, uh, get part of the, the coalition. But we haven't heard anything back yet. We don't know if it's going to work. But if we do this, it will be as what happened in 2005 when in Washington, D.C., when the unions came together with over 50 leftist groups, including Emily's List, Planned Parenthood, SEIU. They did a $50,000 buy-in and a vow of silence at a union table in D.C., and they created the Voter Activation Network. Ten years later, they had one of the largest systems ever as far as turnout and whatever, and now they're about to go into phase two that Organizing for Action has formed after, out of what it was, Organizing for America. They're going into a phase that will lead for a progressive majority for the next 50 years. This is how big this is. If this happens, we will be able to actively compete for the first time with the left and to have a ground game. So if you guys know funders, if you know groups, they need to, you need to start asking them, when are you going to train us? When are you going to get a ground game? What about K. Carl Smith? What about Anita Mockery? What about the people that are willing to train us? K. Carl is part of this whole progress too, process too. And I told him that yesterday. I was like, hey, I put you in there, but I didn't get a chance to tell you ahead of time. But I couldn't think of anybody else who would run a ground game like he could. We need to start asking for this stuff. And, and every time the RNC sends me a, a, a letter, I write something on it and send it back. We need to get vocal, guys, seriously. Any other questions? One last one. If we get a group, I say yeah. I, I don't want to say yeah because that's way, way too weak of a word. When we get a when we get a group of people in Baton Rouge together, and hopefully this this conference is a seed for that group, uh, a fertile seed. Um, can we uh, basically? Are you available to us? I'm Anita at truthevote.org or Anita Mon Anita Moncrief at gmail.com. We, you, I am available to you. Brandon Darby will be available to you, yes. and hopefully Kate Call. We're working on something. I can't tell you the name of it now, but it's an overarching uh, project that will include some of the top organizations on the right working together for training. And if this gets going, it will start as early as this summer. Yeah. Any other questions? Good. Well, thank you guys so much for the opportunity to be here. I want to thank Scott and Christy. Hey, just a couple of quick announcements. We're going to take another break. Um